Good evening. Welcome to Word and Sword TV broadcast brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. I'm Stan Adams, and I'm glad that you're with us tonight. We want to welcome you to our program. So many of you have tuned in, and we appreciate so much your time and your uh, willingness to study the Bible with us tonight. The subject we're going to be talking about tonight, at the very first part of our program, and most probably most of the program, will be on the use of uh, on tongue speaking, on the Holy Spirit. And also, we have a question that's been submitted also on uh, the term, on the, should a Christian tithe today? So we'll get started on that in just a minute. But we want to welcome you to our program, and uh, we want to thank you for tuning here. Uh, you have a number of channels you can tune to. But if you're tuned here, you want to study the Bible, and we are glad that you've done that. We hope you have your Bible ready to study along with us as we go through God's Word. We want to let you know that our call operators are standing by. This is a live program and has all the benefits and the pitfalls of a live program. So if I cough or if I have to sneeze or whatever, I'll try to be as good as I can about that and cover the microphone. But uh, anyway, that's uh, what live TV is all about. <clears throat> but we want you to call tonight. If you would like a copy of this program to use with your friends or your neighbors, you can call in and ask for a copy of the presentation either in uh, printed form or by uh, data disk in some way. You can also ask for a free Bible correspondence course, which we offer. We have two of them that we offer. And also you can ask for a free track, which is a written sermon on any number of Bible subjects. You let our operators know the subject and we'll get you a track on that subject. You can ask for a map of the building or you can ask to be added to our Beacon mailing list. The Beacon is the bulletin of the Newton Church of Christ. And uh, it is mailed out quarterly, but it is a monthly publication. And we also want you to know that you can get free Bible study aids uh, in at www.wordandsword.com. www.wordandsword.com. And we want to put that up there for you. And you can call in tonight with your Bible question and your biblical comments or questions that you might have. If you'd like to leave those with the operators, uh, you, they'll write your question down. And uh, you, if you will, uh, they will screen you, make sure. And we would ask you to be decent and kind when you do uh, come on the program if you choose to do that. But if not, just leave your question with one of our operators and they'll get it to me while the program is going on. And if it is on the subject of the Holy Spirit, I'll deal with it. I'll cut away and deal with that. And if it is not, then we'll uh, deal with that more toward the end of the program. And if we don't get to it adequately, we'll cover it the next program. But your questions are so important, and it shows that you care about the study in God's Word, and you want to know what God's Word says. We are not going to guess at your question. We're going to give you a book, chapter, and verse answer. And if we can't do that, then we will delay that and we'll get you get that information for you if it's in God's Word and we'll get back to you. But you'll need to leave your information. We want to assure you that we are not going to spam you. We're not going to badger you with any type of situation where we're going to be uh, on your case all the time with your address or abuse your address or sell it. Uh, we respect highly your uh, privacy and your willingness to call into the program and openly and honestly study the Bible. We're loyal to our listeners, and I hope our listeners are, and what, uh, viewers are loyal to us. And we want to, we want again, thank you for tuning in tonight to our program. We would like you, we have a problem with advancing here. We'd like for you also to know that we are on Twitter, and we are, you, you can uh, access us on Facebook too at, at www.facebook.com Word and Sword and also at facebook.com slash Newton North Carolina Church of Christ. And you can follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword. And we can have a discussion on those men, uh, mediums if you would like. But again, it's very important that all of us get in our Bibles and study them. Now remember I said get in our Bibles, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment, and you'll see the parallel when we're talking about the Holy Spirit. When we say get into our Bibles, that's the phrase we use that we understand. It doesn't literally mean climb into your Bible. It just means you need to get into Bible study. And although we didn't say it that way, you understood it, didn't you? So that's, uh, we're going to talk about that in a little while. 
Well, call tonight, 828-485-5555. That number will be scrolling throughout the program in the bottom right-hand corner of your TV set. And again, we thank you for tuning in tonight. What does the Bible say about salvation? The most important consideration anybody could ever give is what does, what am I, what's going to happen to my soul one day? Well, according to Jesus in John 12 and verse 48, we are to hear the words that He has spoken. In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Also in John 8, 24, we have to believe that He is or we die in our sins. Romans 10 and verse 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Galatians 3.26, we're, um, we're saved by faith, but, and, th and that passage teaches that. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that comes to Him must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So the Bible clearly teaches hearing and believing is a part of our salvation, essential to our salvation. And also in Luke 13 and verse 3, except you repent, you'll all perish. In Acts 2.38, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In Acts 17.30, uh, times of this ignorance God winked at, but now He requires all men everywhere to come to repentance. All right, so I think we would have agreement up to this point that all of these things are essential for our salvation. In Matthew 10 and verse 32, if we confess that Jesus, uh, Jesus before men, He will confess us before the Father. In Acts chapter 8, 27 through 39, the eunuch confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And we just read Romans 10, 10, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we would have agreement, I would think, with all of us who are watching tonight on the first four things there. But then we get to baptism and all of a sudden there's a controversy among religious people. Let's look and see what Jesus said because the Bible is the one that settles all things. The Word of God settles the issues if we'll let it and get our own ideas out of our minds. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieves will be condemned. Acts 2, 38, Peter told the people on Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Romans 6, 4 through 6, we see that baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. Christ died, was buried, and arose for us. And so he asked that we do a reciprocal type of thing for him, although it uh, doesn't mean the same thing as what he did. Galatians 3.27 tells us we put, on, we put Christ on in baptism. And 1 Peter 3.21 says that baptism saves us. Well, do we just spin the wheel here and pick out either hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, or being baptized? Is that what we do? Just pick one and that's how you go to heaven? Or do all of these mean something? Must we incorporate all of these into our life in order to be pleasing to God and be a true Christian as the Bible teaches? Friends, I think the answer is obvious, isn't it? We can't just ignore all of what Jesus said on other su subjects about salvation and just pick the one we like and camp out there. We've got to take all of what Jesus said and what the Bible teaches. So if we fulfill all these commandments, we will, all, we will be saved, and the Lord adds us to His church, Acts 2.47. The saved are in the church. There is only one. Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus said He'd build His church. Now you'll be a Christian and are expected to serve God faithfully until death in, the, in His church, and dealing it with life the way that He has so ordained you to deal with it. Well friends, that's what the Bible says. And you are tuned in to this program, and if you don't like the first part of it, where we've given you, oh goodness, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, about 30 scriptures here. If you don't um, like those, that approach to a Bible study, then you're on the wrong channel. But we, we think that you're here for a reason. You want to study the Bible. You don't want to hear what I have to say. You want to hear what God has to say through His Word. And so we're going to try our best to get out of the way of God's Word tonight and let it speak to us as it is simply and plainly the Word of God. Now notice here in the Bible, I would like to ask a question, and if you would 
Uh, sometimes people say, well, you're not supposed to ask questions, you're supposed to answer them. Well, I want to ask you something tonight. If you're watching tonight and you can find in the Bible how to become a Baptist, I would appreciate you calling in. If you can find in the Bible how to become a Lutheran, I would appreciate it if you would call in and tell us. If you can find in the Bible how to become a Mormon, please call in. If you can find in the Bible uh, how to become a Catholic, please call in. And I, I appreciate it. And just, you, just, uh, it just, you just pick a denomination. Find it in the Bible. I can find how to become a New Testament Christian, a member of the Lord's Church in the Bible, but I cannot find how to become a member of a denomination anywhere in the Bible. I may be limited. I may just be missing something. And you'd be my friend if you'd tell me where that is. But if it's not there, then we all honestly need to look and say, you know what? There was only one church in the New Testament. And we all need to be a member of that one. And we can be. If we practice the things they practiced in the New Testament, we can be a member of the body of Christ. We can faithfully serve the Lord in His church. Jesus Christ is king over His kingdom right now. His kingdom is the church. It is His body. And He only has one body. And there is only one head. So that's Ephesians chapter 5. And so we want to recognize that. Well, we want to get to a question tonight. If you have your, have your Bibles, uh, tune in there. We want to invite you to the, attend the assemblies of the Newton Church of Christ. And here's the assembly times of the Newton Church of Christ at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Uh, their service times are Bible study at 930, worship at 11, and then their Wednesday night Bible study at 7. And let's post that chart up there if we can. That uh, lets everybody know when the Newton Church of Christ meets. All right, so there we are, and uh, go and worship with those folks. If you're not in that area, make sure that you do uh, find a local congregation of the, of the saints meeting in different locations. We have faithful congregations meeting in Lincolnton. We have faithful congregation meeting at Mineral Springs and Tryon Street, over into Asheville, up at Spruce Pine, over in Winston-Salem, and uh, they're just faithful churches of the Lord's people worshiping, uh, meeting in a lot of locations. And you need to avail yourself of those places and look up their information and worship with them if you can. If you're just traveling through, do that. If you're located in that area and you have not found the local congregation where you want to be yet, then you locate with one of those. But find a faithful church of the Lord to be with. That's what you need to do. And again, we are all about converting souls and wherever they might be. And if you call in from a, a distant location, uh, we, had, we have also, I neglected to mention, the Polkton Church over out of Charlotte that also is available over state line, also on the, uh, out of Charlotte, and also over in South Carolina, several churches that are over that way. So again, if you're in our listing audience and you don't know where the Church of Christ is located, where you are, please call in and we'll do our best to locate a faithful church for you to go to and to be involved in Bible study right there. So again, thank you for, for your uh, time tonight and for tuning in. And uh, the Word and Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, paid full, fully, for fully by their uh, free will offerings on the first day of the week, part of their work of evangelization in the, in the kingdom. You can contact them by going to, w, uh, to contact at wordandsword.com or by phone at 828-465-3009. Or you can contact them by mail by going to P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Again, the website is www.wordandsword.com. Please uh, avail yourself of the study material, a wealth of information on that uh, website. Very good website for you to go and, and have some help in your Bible study if you need it. But nothing beats just getting your Bible out and reading it and, and digesting it. Don't just read your Bible. Pay attention to what it's saying. If you have a question about something that it's saying, ask somebody that would know. Tonight we're going to talk about unity in religion, and particularly as it relates to different Bible subjects. We've just brought up a subject that is a very important subject, that we have disagreement with other people in different denominations today 
on the subject of salvation. Now you would think that we could agree on what it takes to save a person, wouldn't you? You'd think we could all have agreement on that. And you know what? We can. We can agree on what, what it takes to save a person if we'll go to the Bible and let it be our authority. But once again, we have to go by what the Bible teaches and not by what we think it teaches. Let's just look at it and see what it says. And so we're going to talk about that tonight in just a moment as we get into our program. But we would like for you, if you would, to go with us now as we go into the question that was asked by one of our, our callers and one of our viewers. Leonard uh, is a very uh, faithful listener. He's had a stroke. And we're, we hope that he's doing better tonight and that he's feeling much better. But he, and along with some of his friends, are watching the program this evening, as they always do. And we are uh, going to answer a question that some of his um, friends had regarding what is, it, what is tithing and is it required of us today? Well, to answer that question from the Bible, and again, get your Bible out and we'll give you time to turn there. But get your Bible out, if you will, and turn to Leviticus chapter 27, and let's look at verses 30 and 32. The, the tithing was a, was a law that was given to the Jew. It was given in the, law, in the law of Moses. It was a part of the law of Moses and was given to them. All the tithe of the land, verse 30 of Leviticus chapter 27, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Now that tithe is a tenth. So a tenth part of all the harvest of the seed of the harvest. A tenth of all of that was to go to God. It was to be dedicated to God and given to Him. And that was everyone. Everyone, poor, rich, whatever in between. A tenth was to be given. And notice in, in, uh, in verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth part shall be holy unto the Lord. So not only of the fruit of the land, but also of the, of the increase of a flock. All of that, one-tenth of it, was to be given to God and set apart to God for His purposes. And then if you will, look on down into Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18, verses 26 and 27. That's Numbers 18, verses 26 and 27. And this is to the Levites. Now this is how we know that this was to the people of the Old Covenant. Moses is speaking and saying, Thus speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take of the children of Israel the tithes that I have given you from them for your inheritance, there ye shall offer up a heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing field and the fullness of the winepress. So, once again, one-tenth was to be dedicated to the Lord, everything that was there. And the Levites were also bound to do that. All Jews were bound to give a tenth of everything they had profit to the Lord. And all the seed they had, everything that was gross income, they were supposed to do that. And that was before they did anything else. First fruits. God got the first, the best. Okay? Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14. And we're going to go to verses 28 and 29. Deuteronomy 14 and verses 28 and 29. Now, you'll notice we're, we're reading the Old Testament. Because tithing is taught in the Old Testament, but not taught in the New Testament. So we'll look at that in a moment. At the end of three years you shall bring forth all the tithe of your increase the same year, and lay it upon thy gates. And the Levite, because he has no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widows that are within thy gates, shall come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hand that thou hast done." So part of the use of the, of the tithe was to be used for those who were indigent, those who were unable to even be able to put bread in their mouth. 
They were to be taken care of, the widow, the, the, the needy person, the stranger that was sojourning in the land, didn't have any means of income. All of that was to be done by the, uh, was to be taken care of by the, part of it by the, ten, by the tenth that was given. And again, that was not all that it was to be used for, but that is one thing it was. So that's what the Bible teaches, what the old law teaches about tithing. There is no question but that the, the devout Jew of the Old Testament would have had to have given one-tenth of all that he had to the Lord. Now, that being said, a Jew of the Hebrew period would have given much more than that if he had done all the sacrifices that he was supposed to give. And you count in the value of all the sacrifices and the value of raising the, the perfect lamb for the sin offering in his family and taking it to the priest, the, all the things that are involved in that, all the things that are involved in the feed, you know, thingy like, things like that. So all of that, and plus all the other offerings that were to be given to the Lord would have required a person to have given much more than 10%. But they were to tithe, yes, they were to tithe. And they were commanded to do that. But now, in the New Testament, there is no such uh, amount given. Now, that we are to give to the Lord, the Bible does teach that. But remember, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ nailed the old law to the cross. And some who may have asked this question this evening, maybe they're, they're still thinking that the Old Testament still applies to us. And the, the commandment, the fourth commandment on the Sabbath day, things like that. But the old law was nailed to the cross, Paul tells the Colossians. He took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. At the cross, the new law was instituted and fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem when the New Testament church was established. The first gospel sermon was preached. And we are not under the old law. Now, if we are going to buy tithing because the Old Testament says you're supposed to do it, then we're also going to have to bind all the dietary laws. Can't eat anything like a catfish or anything like that. No shrimp, no anything like that. And so we would have to, have to, have to be involved in all of that. We would have to travel to Jerusalem three times a year and so on and so forth. We would have to keep all the law because Paul says in Galatians that if a person keeps part of the law, he is a debtor to keep all of it. So in that instance, if you're going to bind circumcision, then you have to bind all of the old law. If you're going to bind uh, the circumcising your child on the eighth day, that was part of the, of the old law. Well, person may choose to do that with their children today, but it's not because it's a part of the law that God, that God says we have to do that today. But under the law of Moses, they did have to do it. Look at all the feast days, and then look at the year of Jubilee that they had there, where everything returned back. Every seventh year, the land was to rest from its labors. And then on the seventh year, the 70th year, there was supposed to be a renewal or a return of all the land back to its original place, to its original people. So again, you look at the cost that it would, things that, how much it would cost to be a Jew during the time of Moses. It was quite expensive, but it was worth it. And it's, it's also obvious several places in the Old Testament that the Jew didn't seem to begrudge giving money to God. When it came time to build the tabernacle, you remember, Moses had to tell them to stop giving. And that was in addition to their tithes. Okay? So he had to tell them that they had given enough. Well, does that mean that because the New Testament doesn't mention tithing that I can get by with, with cheating God and not giving Him a dime? No. Doesn't mean that because in the New Testament, now get your Bibles out and let's see what the new, the new law says. In 1 Corinthians, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we see there that the Lord says that we are to cheerfully give, but we are to give as we have prospered, 
Now, the Lord doesn't limit it to just 10 percent. And under the new law, we have a law that is given to us that we are to, to, to be cheerful in our giving. That's 2 Corinthians 9, not 1 Corinthians 9. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. If you've got your Bibles, look there if you will. Verse 16, chapter 16, verse 1, concerning the collection for the saints, as I gave order to Galatia, church, Galatian churches, even I do to you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. All right, so when was giving to be done in the church of the New Testament? It was on the first day of the week. And it was every first day of the week. And it is one of the two things that God has specified in worship that are to be done only on that day. Now friends, there's a lot of ways that people use in, in religious groups today to raise funds. People sell cakes, they sell pies, they sell coffee and donuts, they sell uh, steak dinners, they sell all these types of things. But you think about that, and there is no authority, top, side, or bottom in the Bible for any of that. So you think about that, and the only authority we have in the Bible is the collection of the saints on the first day of every week. How much are they supposed to give? They're supposed to give as they have prospered. Let each one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, verse 2, as God has prospered. No limit of a tithe, no just 10%. It is as we have prospered. God has given us the gifts and the blessings that we enjoy. Should we try to cheat Him out of His part? Should we get all of these blessings and give Him nothing? Because He doesn't specify that we're supposed to give Him a tenth? How do we determine how much we need to give to God? Well, the fact is, he deserves it all, doesn't he? He deserves all of it, but he doesn't ask all of it. He understands we have to make a living and raise children and uh, prepare for our futures. He knows that. And he has given us our jobs for that purpose. So our jobs are a blessing. Our children are a blessing. Our lives are a blessing. Our houses, our cars, all of these things we are allowed to have because God blesses us. And he, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. An evil person can make money just like a righteous person. So what should the righteous do? Should a righteous person try to cheat God out of all he can and take all that he can for himself? Well, notice in 1 Timothy that Paul says there to Timothy, he says, the love of money, along about chapter 6, is the root of all sorts of evil. Now, money is can be useful and can be used for good purposes. Or it can be hoarded and cost people their souls. So the work of the church is very important. Work of the church is to be done by the free will giving on the first day of the week of the members of the body of Christ. And anywhere I've ever been and worship with the brethren, I, there is always an opportunity on the first day of the week to lay by in store as God has prospered. Now, notice here that the New Testament church at 1 Corinthians 16, 2 is not authorized to solicit funds from those who are visiting. So we don't charge people to visit services. We, people aren't bound to put some money in or we, or we uh, ask them to leave. That's not something that's right. The New Testament church's work is financed by its members. And the threefold nature of what's, what the money is spent on, it can only be spent on evangelism, on edification, and on limited benevolence. And that's it. It cannot be used to, to take care of the needy of the world, but the church can use it in benevolence to take care of its own needy. But just like in the Old Testament times, a Christian's giving is not limited only to his giving at church. 
Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 and James 1 27 says that we have an obligation to those that are outside even. Individuals do, but not the church. The church, the work of the church is threefold. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence. Now turn, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll see also there uh, what is talked talk to about giving, what Paul says about this. He says that we should recognize that we are to be cheerful givers. And notice what he says in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, where you had noticed before, and the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. But this I say, the one that sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Now that's a farming illustration there that says if you don't plant, if you don't sow much seed, you don't get much fruit back. And that's, uh, that's just common. If you, if you only sow one acre, you're only going to get an acre of, of produce. But if you sow 40 acres, you're going to get 40 acres of produce. So you sow sparingly, you get less. You sow bountifully, you get more. And the fruit comes forth. So you throw one corn seed out and look what comes from that. Or you sow several corn seeds out in the field and look how many ears of corn you get out of that, you see. God gives forth abundantly from the, from the fruit of the ground to us. So if we sow things to God, if we uh, give to the Lord, then He will return it to us. But we don't have to worry about that. God will take care of us no matter what. Well, look, if you will, he that says, I sow bountifully, will reap bountifully, and also every man according, here it is again, as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give. And notice the attitude, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and he can make his grace to abound to us all. So God's grace is abundant, His long-suffering is abundant, His mercy and His pardon is abundant, and His sacrifice of His Son was an abundant gift for us. So we should do our best to be cheerful and willing and not look at God and say, how little can I get by with, but how much can I do? And still do the other things that God has commanded me to do. Now let me hasten to say there are some even in the church that believe that you are not supposed to give, you're not bound to give from your first fruits. Well, I, I beg to differ with you on that. That's just not biblical. We don't give God our leftovers. God gets from the top. Before anything else comes out, He should get a portion of what we have from the top. It should be a part of our budgets, and we should also budget as Christians for taking care of those in the world that may be needy. So again, that's just a part of who we are as Christians. Now some of you who watch this program have commented. I've seen some of you that have commented in person to me when around town, and then I've, some others of you have called in and wondered uh, why you can't give money here. Well, because this program is financed by the giving of the New Testament church at Newton. And it's by their members. They put in money on the first day of the week and then the check is written for the, for the cost of this program. And it, it's one church. Now we don't solicit funds by having bake sales or by having rallies or anything like that. And we don't solicit funds by selling prayer claws or little gimmicks and telling you if you, if you come in, we'll, we'll send you, if you send in $10, we'll give you a bottle of oil and then you'll become rich as a result of that. No, we don't cheapen that. That is just a cheap way to, to dupe people into sending money. And there's enough graft and corruption in the religious world to go around right now. And I think you could all say a hearty amen to that. There's just an awful lot going on. And I tell you what, that is going to be the cause of a lot of people losing their souls by getting people to, to send in money to them and it goes in their pocket to buy them an airplane or to buy them this or that. Now the, the sad thing is that they say they're directed by the Holy Spirit to tell you that. 
Well, the Bible, we've just read you what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is speaking through the Word of God, and he, I, just, I just read it to you, what the Holy Spirit says. And so when some guy tells you that the Holy Spirit told him something that's different from here, turn to Galatians chapter 6, and let's see what God says about such a fellow as that. Galatians 6, have you got your Bibles? Go ahead and turn there to Galatians chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. And it says, Though we, or an angel from heaven, speak unto you any other words than what we have spoken unto you, some say gospel there, then let them be anathema. That means damned. Let them be condemned forever. If someone speaks something, even if an angel from heaven says something that is not what was delivered to the saints through the Scripture, then let them be anathema. So everyone, every TV evangelist that comes on, me or anyone else, and tells you that you need to send them money so they can, uh, and that God told them to tell you to send, them, send money in, they're lying to you. Because God did not contradict Himself. And churches are supposed to be, the New Testament church is to support its own work and not to be begging the community for, to help it with its work. Now, if you attend a service of the Church of Christ and the collection plate comes around and you, you put something in, we're not going to say, well, here, you've got, you got to take that back. But hopefully all churches will tell you when they, before they pass the plate around that this is not a solicitation of funds from the visitors. We're just glad you're here to hear God's Word. Nor is it a solicitation of funds from those who are visiting from other areas. Now, if someone chooses to give, then that's up to them. And we don't know where it comes from when we count it. We don't take a tally to see who's giving. We don't give out envelopes and uh, make sure you're giving, and then we send you a statement of how much you owe us if you hadn't done it on time. That's, that, that, notice in both of these passages, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 16, and so, or, or 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 9, in both those passages, it is as you have prospered and as you have decided to do. Now, you're responsible for what you do. And God knows whether you're giving as you've prospered or not in proportion to how you prospered. Now, some people say, well, I haven't prospered, so I, didn't want, I, don't, I won't give. Well, what they mean by that is I didn't get enough money and I had to go sell my boat or I had, to, I had to go out on my boat trip and buy gas on that. Well, no, no. You, you don't go spend money on the boat and on the vacation and cheat God out of what you spent and say, well, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't have anything left. No, remember, He gets the first. And that's all He'll accept. And that's what we should recognize. God deserves so much, and we give Him so little. And there is so much work to be done in the kingdom that we should recognize that the New Testament church needs to support the sowing of the seed of the Word of God and the preaching of God's Word wherever it is done. And we need to be behind that and all about helping lost souls come to Christ wherever they are and not be people that are just devoted to what happens in our congregation. We want to sow the seed of the, of the gospel all over the world if we can. And however we can have a part in that, we should do it. And we should not be ugly about that and, or myopic about that and say we're just taking care of our own house. No, the world is the, is the place where we sow the seed. And where we start where we are, of course, but then we want to have the gospel spread everywhere. And we should rejoice that the gospel is being spread everywhere, folks, and that we have the means by which to help that be done. So that's what the Bible says about giving in the New Testament times. So today, the reason we don't tithe to the questioner that called in, we are not Jews. We are not under the law of Moses. We are under the law of Christ. And that does not excuse us into giving as little as we can to God. But what we do is we lay by in store every first day of the week. 
And it's interesting to me that uh, there are churches that are out there that call themselves uh, belonging to the Lord that never miss an opportunity to pass the plate. But you know that the Lord said do it once a week. Now we have gospel meetings every no- where, where we meet every night of the week, but you know we only take up the collection on the first day of the week. Again, we're not all about grabbing money from people. And that is a surprise to a lot of people. I bet if you haven't been listening to the program or watching the program, you're surprised about that. And we're going to say it again, don't send us any money on this program. This program is financed by the free will offering of God's people at the Newton Church of Christ. And so don't send any money in. We're fine. And we've been going along for over 30 years on this program by that same practice. You know why it works so well? Because it's God's plan. It's God's plan of finance. And His plan works better than any division, any situation of man. There have been some programs that are uh, come and go on this program, and we keep going. And God has blessed us in that, because this program is continuing to go, because we're not dependent upon whether somebody sends us money or doesn't send us money. This is a work of the congregation, and that is what is done with the monies. And it is fully supported, and so we don't have to worry about whether somebody gets upset with us or whatever, we're, we're going to keep doing the things that God has told us to do in the sowing of the seed and using this venue as long as we can find usefulness in it. And that's what we're going to be doing. And that's God's plan. Works every time. So let's, let's work God's plan, okay? Now remember what we said about having unity in religion. Jesus prayed in John 17 verses 20 and 21. I don't pray for these alone, Father, but for those also who shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou art in me, and I in thee, that they all might be one in us, that the world might believe that you have sent me. It is no wonder that the world is in such a bad shape when we have such division in the religious world. The latest figure I heard the other day and read in some that in the latest survey was 38,000 different denominations today. And a lot of those are non-denominational denominations. You think about that, 38,000, and it's growing every day. It's more now, because I heard that about three days ago. Well, isn't that a shame? Are there 38,000 ways to heaven? Or is, can we have unity on how to get to heaven? We just, read, we just read the scriptures, some 30 of them. If we'll go by this, folks, we can have unity. If we'll go by the New Testament and let it be our rule of faith and practice. We can have unity on how much money we're supposed to g- gather on the first day of the week and how we're supposed to gather it and how we're supposed to give. You know, the, the amount at the end of the day doesn't matter. We don't set goals at the church and say it has to be this much each week. You have to do this. and you, We don't go around and assign and ask people what they make and say you've got to give this or you've got to give that. Because the Bible doesn't authorize that. It's the free will offering of a heart that is broken by God and wants to do everything it can to please the Lord and give all they can to Him. And when you have a heart like that, you won't be asking how little I can do, you'll be asking how much more can I do. And that's in every aspect of your life. We can have oneness on that, folks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul laments the fact that the church at Corinth is so divided. He says, I beseech you, that's the, we could use the word beg. I beg of you, brethren, or I beseech you, brethren, by the name of Jesus Christ, or by His authority that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. So that tells us that it is possible for all of us to be unified on what God wants us to do, 
And we can speak the same things with one voice and we can be united. And as a result, the world will believe that we came from Jesus. But right now, the way things are in the religious world, and even in the body of Christ, when there's division and chaos in the body of Christ, it's no wonder that so many brethren fall away because they're supposed to be able to look to their brethren and see unity and not divisiveness and chaos and sniping here and sniping there and touchiness all over nothing. They're not supposed to be able to see that. That's a false approach to, uh, and a false picture of who Jesus is, isn't it? And they're supposed to be able to see in Christians Christ living in all of us. And so we can have unity when we go by the same pattern. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29, the writer there, the wisest man who ever lived other than Jesus, says, I have found this, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Man is, there is no end to what he can find to be all gnarled up over. In Proverbs 8 and verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, to hate pride and arrogance and every evil way and the froward mouth, God says, I hate. Crooked mouth, I hate. False teacher, I hate. Arrogance and pride and evil, I hate. And when I fear the Lord, I hate those things too. Not only does God hate them, but the child of God hates them. In Proverbs 14 and verse 12, there's a way that seems right to men, but the end thereof is the ways of death. So that tells me that I can be sincerely wrong. Now, have you ever been sincerely wrong? I had a discussion with my wife the other day. It's my birthday coming up, and she said, let's go down and buy you some new pants. Yours are just worn out. Well, she has to kind of force me to do that kind of thing. So we went down and bought pants, and she said, well, you don't need that pair because you've already got a pair of that color. And I said, no, I don't. I don't have a pair that's that color. And she said, yes, you do. You have a pair that that's color. So we had a little mild disagreement on that. But guess what? I went ahead and bought them because I, I just knew that I didn't have a pair of pants that, that, that color. Well, I got home, and guess what I found out? Most of you men can sympathize. My wife was right. And I sincerely thought that I had a pair of pants that was the color that I bought. Or that, that I did not have a pair of pants that color, I'm sorry. Well, when I got home and saw that I did have that same pair of pants, I felt really bad. But I'll tell you this, I was sincere. I thought that I was just as right as I could be. But you know what? I was sincerely wrong. And all of us have gone through similar situations, haven't we? Where we've been sincerely wrong about something. We, we didn't intend to be wrong. We're, we're not trying to be wrong. We're not sitting back and saying, I think I'll be wrong today. But we can be sincerely wrong. And a lot of people in, religious, in religion are sincerely going about the wrong way all the time thinking they're right. We have, we have asked over and over on this program that if you see us teaching anything that's not from God's Word, call us on that and let us know. In Romans 3 and verse 4, Paul tells the Romans there, let God be true and let every man be a liar. Every last one of us is capable of believing a lie, of teaching a lie, and of lying ourselves. It's possible for all of us to do that, and even to do so with a sincere heart. But lies are destructive. Whether you're sincere or insincere, whether you're intentional or unintentional, the destruction still comes from lies. And so we have to be careful and recognize that we have to understand that we are fallible people. And we don't need to hold on like a bulldog or pit bull to a stick or like a, a turtle just uh, that lat latches down on something and never turns loose of it. We don't need to be that way. 
If something is wrong, please somebody bring it to my attention so I can turn it loose. That should be our attitude. But sadly, friends, that is not the attitude of many people that are in denominations. They have been taught that way all their life, and they do not examine what they believe in the light of the Scriptures, and as a result of that, they will be lost whether they're sincere in their belief or insincere in their belief. Truth, friends, has nothing to hide from an examination. If we're right, wonderful. If we're wrong, thank you for showing us from God's Word where we're wrong. That should be our attitude. But you know there's people out there that they, they just set their hearts and their minds. I was listening to somebody the other day said they had some relatives that said you can go to any church in the world that you want to go to, but don't you dare go to the Church of Christ. They're a bunch of crazy people. And I asked the person, I said, have they ever been to the Church of Christ? Well, no. I said, well, then how do they know we're crazy? I hope that if you're watching this program, you're not watching it because you think I'm crazy. I hope you're watching this program because we're teaching the Bible. And I think you'll find that we're very reasonable in our study. I'm not, I'm not an exception to a Christian. All Christians are willing to examine openly, or should be, the Word of God to see if the things that are being said are true, like the Bereans. That's how we should be. In Isaiah 55, verses 9 through 11, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, saith the Lord. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Just like that, he says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. Notice my word. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereto I send it. You know what that means? Ooh, Romans 1.16, we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it's God's power into salvation to all that believe. It's not going to return to him void. You can reject it, you can throw it away, you can stomp on it, you can burn it up. But I tell you what, it's going to be victorious. It's going to be the book by which you'll be judged one day. The words. God has always communicated to His people through words. In the beginning, God told Adam and Eve, He told them what to do, and He told them one prohibit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. Those were spoken words. And they were directly given to Adam and Eve. Did they listen? Oh, they heard what he said. Did they pay attention to it? Nope. Sure didn't. Eve was deceived because Satan comes along and throws one word in there. And he says, God said this, but I'm telling you, that you will not surely die. God said you will surely die. I'm saying you will not surely die. He inserted a knot in there. And that is the knot in the devil's tail. That he tells us something, he just inserts a word. The devil knows scripture. He quoted it and, and referred to it to Jesus in Matthew 3 when he tempted Jesus. Does not the word say? Okay. And so, the devil, if he knows Scripture, that tells us that we can also be people that are his agents and unknowingly teach error. Okay? We can have unity, friends, if we use the same standard, and that's God's Word. If we rightly divide that standard, and if we put our creeds and our feelings and our ideas aside and let God be true and let every man be a liar. That's how we have unity, friends. Not by being faithful to our denomination. Not by saying grandma believed it, granddad believed it, great granddad believed it, and I was born that way and I'll die that way. No. Nope. What, a, what a horrible way to go through life, just doing something because somebody else did it. That's one of the first things we're taught as children. You can remember the, your mama saying, I think every mama has said it. 
well, if, uh, if Johnny jumped off the, off the mountain, would you jump off the mountain? And we look at ourselves, hang our head, and we'll no. Well, people today will go to hell because grandma went to hell. Or because granddad did. Because granddad and grandma, they're my heroes. And I, if I do something that I shouldn't do, uh, and, and I, I want to do it different than grandma and granddad, then I'll be lost. Do you have the same job granddad had? You're judging granddad if you have a different job. No, you're not. Do you make the same money granddad made? No. Well, are you judging granddad when you make more money than granddad did? No. You know the point. We learn differently. We have more skills. We are able to see things a little more clearer and different things. Do you have every viewpoint that your granddad had on everything, politics and everything else? If you don't, then you're betraying your granddad and your grandma. No, we all know that that's not the case. And it's not an affront to our grandparents or our ancestors because we find out something that they didn't know. And so it is in religion, friends, the same way. If we won't honor men in our, in, or denominations uh, over what is taught in God's Word, then we can have unity. But we can't honor what a denomination says or what some man says over what God's Word says, friends. And we're going to apply this in just a minute to the Holy Spirit. You know, there's an old song that kids used to sing, and I think adults need to be singing it too. How do I know the Bible tells me so? All right. How do we know the stories of the Bible? How do we know anything about the Holy Spirit or about God if we don't read it in His book? See, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the New Testament, Paul speaking to Timothy, the young evangelist who's going to be preaching, makes this comment. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. Truly furnished unto all good works. Now look at that, if you will. If the Word of God, all Scripture, is given by inspiration of God, that means God breathed, all right? God breathed it. It's given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God might be perfect and furnished thoroughly unto all good works. What else do I need today, friends, other than the Word of God to guide my life? What, do, what else do I need? Let's look at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Study to show yourself approved of God, a workman that needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing, watch this, the word of truth. So I have an obligation not just to know the truth, but to rightly divide it. And you do too. All of us have that obligation. And since it provides us with everything we need to know, and we can be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works, that tells me I can read it and know how to get to heaven. And it is God's guide. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to me through the Word of God. In Romans 1.16, it's a powerful word. Good religious people, friends, are divided on a number of issues. But in this area particularly, there's an awful lot of division on the subject of the Holy Spirit and how He indwells. Now, let's just get some things out of the way to start with here. There is a Holy Spirit. Let's look tonight at how we can have unity on the subject of the Holy Spirit and how He indwells us. And we'll just have a few minutes to where we can go into that. And we're going to pause for just a moment. It's now we're halfway through our program, and we're going to invite you again to come to the Newton Church of Christ and to be a, be a part of their worship. And as we said, any other area where you are, find the lo nearest local congregation of God's people that are faithfully serving Him, and you be a part of that work. And we want to thank you so much for your time that you've tuned in this evening. Now, we'll give you a moment to kind of get uh, things, get, get resettled a little bit. Get up, walk around. If you're like me, you get stiff. And then come back and let's, uh, let's study from God's Word 
what we need to know about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit indwells the Christian. Now you can already tell that we, we believe that the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit indwells the Christian. Now you just mark that down. The Holy Spirit indwells every Christian. That's not a question. That is undeniably taught in the Scripture. The question is, how does He indwell? All right. Well, let's look at some passages here. Hopefully you're back now and you've had a few moments to, seconds to get up and walk around. So let's get our Bibles settled in and let's have, do some Bible study. Turn to Romans 8, verse 26 and 27. Romans chapter 8, and if you don't have that, then we'll just put it up here for you. A lot of people bring up that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in our prayers. Well, the Bible teaches that. That's true. The Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Who hadn't gone through that issue? I don't know how to ask God for some things. I try, and I try, and I try to find the words, and they just don't come. Does God understand what I'm trying to get across? Does the Spirit intercede in that case? Yes, that's what it says. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us in groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints. Watch this, according to the will of God. It's part of God's plan that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in our prayers. Now, the question comes up, says, now see there, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Well, no, He intercedes for me in this case. And He does something for me, not to me. What does He do for me? He makes sure my prayers are understand, understood to God. My words, words are understood. He makes sure of that. And if I can't find the Word, He knows. Knows the heart. He searches the hearts and knows the things that need to be known. Now, should I make every effort to try to find the words? Absolutely I should. But if I can't, and sometimes in deep grief and sorrow we don't know how to express to God the ways and the things that we want. In distress, we can't find the words. In depressions, we can't find the words sometimes. But God knows our hearts. This is something the Spirit does for us and not to us or in us. What Paul is saying is that when words fail us, the Spirit is able to know our hearts. He does this for us without personally indwelling us. God the Father also knows our hearts when we can't find the words to say to Him. In Acts chapter 2, in verses 38 and 39, the Bible teaches that Christians receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when they're baptized. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. So that's clear, isn't it? Go to the chart, please. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. And then look at this, for the promise is unto you, and unto your children, and to all those who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, let's go back and read this again, and we're going to read it as the Greek might have it. And we're going to read it, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now let's stop there and just circle the word for in your Bible. By the way, it's okay to write in your Bible. Just circle that word for and write over it a three-letter word, E-I-S. And that means in order to obtain. The Greeks had nine or more different words for the term for. All right? F-O-R. We have one word for it. Okay? But they had several. And in this instance, for here means in order to obtain remission of sins. So that tells us repentance and baptism is essential for the remission of our sins, both of them. And notice this, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, now you see the next four, right after Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, whatever your version says. This word for, just circle that one, and it's different. And it's the word gar, G-A-R. And that one means because. 
because. All right, so let's read it. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ in order to obtain the remission of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because the promise is unto you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. All right? Now what promise is he talking about? Well, it's a promise all the way back to Adam that through the seed of Jesus Christ something would come to all men. What is that? All nations would be blessed. That's salvation, friends. And so the gift of the Holy Ghost is, uh, the, is given, you receive it, because of the promise. There was a promise given. And God's fulfilling that promise in giving the Holy Ghost to us. And that gift of the Holy Ghost is not the Holy Ghost Himself. It's something the Holy Ghost gives. All right, we'll discuss that in just a moment. In 2 Thessalonians 2.14, He has called us by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are called by the gospel. I've had people ask me, have you got your calling? Yeah, I was called by the gospel. I was called by the gospel and I preached the gospel. And I do it full time. But God didn't come to me, nor did the Spirit speak to me in a cloud or a telephone pole or any such thing as that. It didn't speak to me that way. I was called by the gospel. Just like every Christian is called by the gospel. And we are called to serve the Lord in whatever capacity we can. And if we have talents to do this or that, we develop those talents and we use them. And we grow. All Christians do that. Where do I find out about that? From the Bible. From the words of the Lord. Where do I find out about the Holy Spirit? From the words that the Holy Spirit delivered. How do I find out about God? From the words that God sent the Holy Spirit to, to uh, give us the, the record of. Now again, here's the, here's the phrase. And if you didn't get that to start with, here's the words. Baptism is for ice in order to obtain remission of sins. And gar is because of the promise was given to you, your children, and those are far off, as many as are called by the gospel. Now what promise was afar off? Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 and you'll see the threefold promise given to Abraham. The nation promise, the land promise, and the seed promise. Now the gift of the Holy Spirit is something the Spirit gives. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit Himself. Now, the comparison of gift of passages, if we wonder what gift of can mean, let's look at some different passages and see what it means in other passages. Because it's, it's an honest question to say, well now, I may, maybe that means the real gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit Himself. Let's look at some other passages and look at the usage of it. Same term in John 4.10, Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, you would, have, you would have asked of Him, and He would have given thee living water. Now is the gift of God, God? Or is it the living water God gives? Ephesians 4, 7, Paul wrote unto each, was the grace given according to the measuring of the gift of Christ. What was given? What was this gift of Christ? Grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. It's not Christ Himself that was given. In this instance, it's a gift of Christ, something that Christ gives. In Acts 2.38, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In each of these passages you have what God, Christ, and the Spirit would give. God was not the gift, but the giver. Christ was not the gift, but the giver. And likewise, the Holy Spirit is not the gift, but the giver. A gift implies a giver, and one cannot have a gift without a giver and a receiver. All right, so what did God give to us? God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. We have a gift. In this instance, it's Jesus Christ. He gave us a gift. It was a gift of His. It's a gift of God that He sent His Son. He didn't have to, <clears throat> but He gave us His Son. All right? Now God didn't give us Himself, okay? He's the Father, but He sent the Son, okay? 
Now, if the Holy Spirit is the gift, then who's the giver? The concept the Holy Spirit is the gift and not the giver makes the gift and the giver one and the same, doesn't it? The gift of God was not God, but the living water He gave. The gift of Christ was not Christ, but the gifts that were named in the text. And the gift of Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit Himself, but the salvation promised in Acts 2.21. Brother Elmer Moore said years ago, I'm not aware of any other circumstance where men would argue as they do about the gift and the giver of Acts 2.38. If one reads about the gift of the Ford Foundation, he would not think that the Ford Foundation was the gift, but that it gave something. It was a giver. And I think that's a good point. Well, in 2 Peter chapter 1, 20-21, knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. It didn't come from, from the apostles getting together and dreaming it up. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled men to prophesy about salvation, friends. And you and I have that benefit today that they did prophesy about it. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel to you with the Holy Spirit, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look upon. The Holy Spirit enables men to do what? To preach the gospel. Now, Somebody says, well, you're a preacher. Do you have the Holy Spirit? I sure do. But does He dwell in me in ways other than the Word? No, He doesn't. And I want to tell you something else. Anybody that gets on the air and tells you that they're just letting the Holy Spirit guide them is basically saying, I didn't prepare my lesson, and I'm just going to talk off the top of my head. You have to study to preach, folks. And you have to study to preach the Word of God. And it's no light matter. And anyone that tells a preacher that he doesn't study is really offending him if he does, if he, if he does study. And if he doesn't study, he needs to get out of the pulpit. But I'll tell you what, we better be sure that the things we're saying. I went over all of this today, again, and before it was all prepared. Now, a lot of the charts that I'm preaching from tonight were prepared by somebody else. But I'll tell you what, I checked every one of them out. And I didn't get up, I'm not, I'm not preaching tonight things that I just dreamed up or just talking off the top of my head. There's study involved here, folks. Just like there's study involved in your own study. You can't just read something and just say, that's what I'm going to say or what I'm going to believe. You have to read it and digest it. And these are the words of the Holy Spirit. When we speak, that's why we say, let's let the Word speak. When we let the Word speak, we're letting the, the, the Spirit speak. And let's just listen to what God says, because He's the one that has given this precious Word to us to guide us into all things pertaining to life and godliness. In Acts 2.21, it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. Salvation, mentioned in both Acts 2.21 and in Acts 2.38, is the gift that the Spirit gives. All right? We call on the name of the Lord. We appeal to the Lord. The Holy Spirit enabled men to prophesy concerning salvation. The Holy Spirit enabled men to preach the message of salvation, and He also validated the message of this salvation by signs and wonders in Hebrews chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, turn there to Hebrews chapter 2, and let's see what, what all these uh, signs and miracles were for. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. God, who at sundry times and in different manners spoke in times past to the, the, the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom He made the world, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, 
when he had by himself purged out sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being so much better than the angels, as he has made an inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. All right? Well, signs and miracles prove that the words being spoken were true. They never converted anybody. Now, they got people's attention to listen to the words that were spoken, but they never were. Signs and miracles were never given or never used by Jesus or anyone else as the power for somebody to be saved. They were the means by which verification was given that they were of God. Now, the salvation of Acts 2.21 can and indeed is the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. So the gift of the Spirit equals salvation, friends. Salvation was prophesied by the Holy Spirit. It was announced by those who preached the gospel, by the Holy Spirit. Their message of salvation was validated by the Holy Spirit. The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 was to those present, not just to them, but to everyone who would truly repent and be baptized. Everyone that complies with the conditions of Acts 2.38 receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's salvation. In Acts 8 and verse 16, those who are baptized in the name of Christ complied with the, with the conditions of Acts 2.38. And they received the gift of the Spirit. But some in Acts 8 and verse 17 had not received the Holy Spirit themselves. And they had to send for the apostles to bestow upon them spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts were not automatically given to somebody when they obeyed the gospel, Acts 8, 17. But salvation was, all right? To receive the gift of the Spirit is not necessarily to receive the Holy Spirit Himself or a manifestation of the Spirit. Well, let's look at this chart because this chart is, describes the dwelling in the heart of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. The Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts. Now, how does He do that? Ephesians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 17 there. Christ may dwell in your hearts, watch this, by faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the height and the depth of Christ Jesus. But He dwells in our hearts, how? Through faith. But He does dwell in our hearts, doesn't He? Christ dwells in our hearts. Now let's look at Christ for a moment. How does Christ dwell in me, and how do I dwell in Christ? Well, we dwell in Christ when we walk by the precepts that Jesus gave us. If we love Him, we keep His commandments. Now, He dwells in us through the Word. He dwells in us as we walk according to His will. If we walk in His ways, we are His children. Does the truth dwell in us, and do we dwell in truth? Yes. We are to go on and abide in the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 9, or we do not have God. There is truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And Christians are to dwell in the truth. The truth, therefore, dwells in the Christian. God the Father dwells in the Christian, and the Christian dwells in the Father. Here's the passages. And that means that we can all be a part of the Father, but it does not mean that the Father personally leaves heaven and comes and dwells in a person. It does not mean a Bible jumps in your mouth and you have to swallow it for the truth to dwell in you does not mean that Jesus has to leave the right hand of God and come jump in us somehow for it to be said, Jesus dwells in us. And if it's true of those parts of the deity, those personalities of deity, and if it's true of the Word, then why would it be any different, friends, when it comes to the Holy Spirit today? If I keep the commandments of the Lord, I am dwelling in God, I am dwelling in truth, I am dwelling in, the, in Christ, and I am dwelling in the Spirit, and vice versa. The Spirit, the Father, the Son, and truth are abiding in me. And nobody has left position. Nobody has gone anywhere. All right? 
So we don't have to have a personal indwelling of something to be in us for us to be said that we are in the Spirit. The Word of God dwells in the Christian. John 15 and verse 7, My words abide in you. John 5, 38, Ye have not this Word abiding in you. John, 1 John 2, 14, The Word of God abides in you. The truth dwells in us, 2 John 2. Now, no one believes that the truth dwells in the Christian by literally jumping inside and the Bible being swallowed by a Christian. No one believes that. The New Testament teaches the Christian dwells in truth. If you continue in my words, you're my disciples. I declare to you the gospel, where also ye received and wherein you stand. So you stand in truth, you stand in the gospel. Now, no one believes that when a Christian is in truth or stands therein, that, the, that he is personally and literally standing in a large copy of the New Testament. No one. That's ridiculous, isn't it? The Word of God has a, such a strong influence on him that he is such a close communion with what it says that they are said to dwell in each other. We are so close to being together that we are dwelling in one another. God the Father is said to dwell. I dwell in them and I walk in them. God, the, One God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all, Ephesians 4, 6. Philippians 2, 13, it is God that works in you. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 12, God dwells in us. He is in us. He dwells in him and God dwells in him. All right, so all of these passages, what we're going through in all these passages is to show you that deity dwells in the Christian. The Bible teaches it. All right? But it do, the, God doesn't have to leave heaven to do, indwell a Christian. All right? 1 John 4.13, Hereby we know that we dwell in Him. 1 John 4.15, He is in God. He who dwells in love dwells in God. Now, no one thinks that Christians are really bodily dwelling within the being of God. We don't go become God to dwell in God. We just obey the things of God. Christ dwells in us. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me. He that abides in me and I in him dwells in me. I in them, if Christ be in you, the life also of Jesus might be manifested in our body. The life of Jesus might be manifested in our flesh. How? No question it takes place, but how? Not by him leaving heaven and dwelling in us. All right? The Christian dwells in Christ. So again, we dwell in Him, He dwells in us. We are baptized into Christ. We put Him on. Every Christian has put on Christ. That does not mean that Christ is somehow getting pretty sparse. No. We are in Christ. We are in Christ when we are new creatures in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. As we have received Christ, so let us walk in Him, rooted and built up in faith, and established in faith. Does anyone think that when one is baptized into Christ for remission of sins, that he personally and bodily is put into the literal body of Jesus? No. No one believes that. In Romans 8 9, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. Here are the passages, friends, that teach us that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Again, remember what we said at the beginning, it is not a question. Does the Bible teach that the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian? He does. The question is how? We're going to read some more passages now that talk about the indwelling of the Spirit. And it is a true Bible subject that the Spirit dwells in us. Notice Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 now. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that dwells in you. There it is. All right. 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Spirit of God dwells in you. How much clearer could that be? 1, John, 1 Corinthians 6.19, know ye not your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you? There it is again. 2, Corinthians, 2 Timothy 1.14, the Holy Spirit which dwells in us. Ephesians 3.16, He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, to the strengthened by the might in His Spirit in the inner man. 1 Thessalonians 4.8, God has given unto us His Holy Spirit. All right, so there you have it. The Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian. 
All of these passages teach the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian. But where does it say that the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart of a Christian literally and personally? It does not say that, does it? The Holy Spirit is deity just as much as the Father and the Son are deity. And friends, the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian not literally and personally, but through the medium and the means of the Word of God. Now in Galatians 5 and verse 25, very important passage. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Now does anyone think they personally and literally live and walk inside the Spirit bodily? Then why would anyone think the Holy Spirit literally indwells the Christian? If we can understand what the Bible says about the Word, about God, and about Christ dwelling in the Christian, and that they do not have to do so literally, then why do people make, make up a different doctrine when it comes to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? That divides people. Again, not a question of does the Holy Spirit dwell in us. It does. The Bible teaches it. So since the Godhead functions united, if one uh, can learn how deity or the Godhead or any member of the Godhead acts, then we can know how the, all the members of the Godhead act. He dwells in our hearts. Christ is said to dwell in our hearts by faith. And faith comes how? Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. All right. Now does that mean the Word of God is the Holy Spirit? No. Doesn't mean it's the Holy Spirit. But it means it is the medium through which the Holy Spirit communicates. Now Paul said in Galatians 3, 2, the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now the necessary implication in Galatians 3, 2 is the Spirit was received by the hearing of faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, friends. And Paul knew that. And that's what he delivers to both Galatians and the Romans. That faith comes by hearing the Word of God. When I hear the Word of God, I hear God. But that is not God speaking to me in some little voice. It is me recalling the things that God has said. Now when I abstain from evil, when I am moved to make a choice between evil or good, you know why I make that choice? Or why anyone does? Because they know that, that a practice either is in accordance with God's will or it isn't. And if they're in doubt, they don't do it until they find out what the Bible says about it. Because we are trying to walk in the Spirit, walk in Christ, walk according to God. Okay? So the Spirit dwells in us as the Word dwells in us. Now where is the passage that teaches that God, Christ, or the Holy Spirit indwell the body of the Christian personally, literally, and bodily? Ephesians 3.17 says Christ dwells in the heart of a Christian through faith. Ephesians 5 says we are filled, Christians are to be filled with the Spirit. Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. When the Word of God dwells in one richly, they are filled with the Spirit. When they are filled with the Spirit or the Spirit dwells in them, the Word of God is dwelling in them. And the Word of God, as the Word dwells in us, so the Spirit dwells in us. The Holy Spirit is not the Word of God, friends. Let's be clear on that. And the Word of God is not the Holy Spirit. But the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, the agent of the Holy Spirit. Rush Limbaugh, Scott Pelley, Lee, uh, Jay Leno, uh, I don't even want to mention the guys that are on the air now at late night. But Fox News, whatever, they come into your home without coming there literally, don't they? Is there influence in your home? Is there influence in your life? Yeah, it is. But they don't have to personally indwell you. They don't have to come live with you to be in your home. They come into our homes through agency. The TV, the radio, the computer, and so on. Just so when one listens to, to the Word of God, same way, and it reveals Christ to us, it does so in a language that the Holy Spirit has selected. The Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 through 14. 
The Holy Spirit delivers words by which we can be saved. One can be said to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him when he has abided by the words of the Spirit. Okay. Now friends, my parents, my mother died back in 1990, 29 years ago, but she still dwells in me, and I dwell in her. But it is not by her coming out of the grave and dwelling in me personally, or me going to the grave and, and dwelling in her personally. It's done by influence. It's done by medium that we dwell in one another. She so affected my life by her godliness that it lives on in me, and hopefully I pass some of that along to my grandchildren. We mutually do this through influence. We are the product of our influences. And the Spirit dwells in us through the influence of God's Word. Notice the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Hebrews 4 says it's able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. A discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's deep, isn't it? Does God know what we're doing? Yeah, sure does. Because this word pierces us. This word is used as a, as referred to as a mirror of the soul. So when I look at what the Word of God says, and then I look at my life and I see discrepancies, God's convicting me. The Spirit is speaking to me through these words that are going to judge me in the last day. Now, if these words are going to judge me and the basis upon which I'm judged in the last day, are they pretty powerful? Yeah because they are the words of God. You know, we, we let those words just, just roll off our lips way too quick. This is the Word of God. No, this is the Word of God. That's what this is. This is God speaking to you. That's why it's so important we believe it. Because if we don't believe it, we'll be condemned. If we don't believe that Jesus is, and how do we know whether Jesus is or not without reading His book? We'll all die in our sins. No man comes to the Father but by Christ. How do I know about Christ? I don't, unless I read the words of Christ, the words of the Spirit, the Word of God, and then I can know what I need to do to please Him. The agency or influence through which deity dwells in us and that we dwell in deity is through the Word of God and no other way, friends. God does not dwell in us personally. And there are a number of people, some of you who are watching, that believe you have some gift of the Holy Spirit. Some of you watching tonight may think you have the gift of tongues. You may think that you are able to, to, to do miracles, things such as that. Well, does the Bible teach such things? How can we know whether the Holy Spirit dwells in us or whether it doesn't? In Ephesians 3.17, Christ dwells there by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the Word of God. The Gospel is the power of God into salvation. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. You, we, uh, this doesn't mean we just accept the Spirit dwells in us through the Word without evidence. So let's have some evidence. Where is the evidence? 1 John 3, 24, Jesus said, He that keeps this, His commandments dwells in Him, and He dwells in Him. Hereby we know that He abides in us by the Spirit He has given us. This is the speaking of Christ, friends. In 1 John chapter 4, 13, these words are quoted almost verbatim. So if deity dwells in our hearts by whether we keep His commandments, to claim we know God and not keep His commandments makes us a liar. And the truth does not abide in us. 1 John 2, 3-5. Now, does deity dwell in you? He does if you've been obedient to the commandments the Word has delivered and the Spirit has delivered, and that God has delivered, that the Son has delivered to you. These things are revealed by God through the Holy Spirit who Christ sent to guide the apostles into all truth. We don't dwell in the teachings revealed through the Holy Spirit written down there, when we do not have the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit when we are doing the things God has told us to do through the Spirit in His Word. Okay? 
Now, in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 4, individuals walk after the Spirit. Verse 5 of Romans 8, one minds the things of the Spirit. Pays attention to them. Verse 9, individuals are said to be in the Spirit, yet the Spirit is said to dwell in the Christian. Romans 8, 1, 11 and 12, one can choose to live either after the flesh or after the Spirit. How do I know how to live after the Spirit? He's told me. Now wait a minute, preacher, you mean the Spirit just talked to you? No. He's told you too. You can read it. That's why we told you to get your Bible out and check. Because this is the Word of God. Okay. Verse 14 of Romans 8 says the Spirit leads us. This is all described in verse 6 as being spiritually minded. In verse 7, as being subject to the law of God. So if I'm subject to the law of God, what is this law? Right here. Then I am walking in the Spirit. I'm spiritually minded. If one is spiritually minded, he's subject to the law of God. He's walking after the Spirit, reminding the things of the Spirit. And he is also living after the Spirit and led by the Spirit. And so he has the Spirit dwelling in him because he's a Christian and being faithful to that calling. Now that's what the Bible says, friends, about the Spirit dwelling in us. Now we have a chart here that is not mine, but it is a very good chart. And if you go, go and look at this chart now, if you will, and notice the things that the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit dwelling in someone through faith, that someone is born of the Spirit, that someone is quickened by the Spirit, that the Spirit saves, the Spirit sanctifies, the Spirit dwells in us, the Spirit leads us, the Spirit comforts us, the Spirit resists us, the Spirit strengthens us, the Spirit instructs us, and the Spirit cleanses us. And look at the passages. If you don't, can't write these down quick enough, call our operator and we'll send you a full copy of everything we've said tonight. And then let's look and see that the Word of God also is said that we have faith in the Word of God. We are born of the Word. We are quickened by the Word. We are saved by the Word. We are sanctified, dwelled in, and led, and comforted, and resisted. We resist the Word of God, strengthened by the Word of God. We are instructed by the Word of God. We are cleansed by the Word of God. Notice you see where there that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, how they work together in accomplishing all of these activities. All right. Well, notice here, the Holy Spirit actions. It has power, it convicts, it testifies, the Holy Spirit teaches and reproves and justifies and raises and witnesses. And so does the Word of God. And there's your passages on all of those. We don't expect you to have all of those there, but uh, if you, again, we, we can sure send you all of this if you would like. So deity dwells in the Christian. How does deity dwell in the Christian? Through the Word of God, friends. As we obey the words that are revealed to us by deity, we dwell in deity and deity dwells in us. It's not a personal indwelling, however. The man of God is made perfect and truly furnished unto every good work. Now, what would a personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit do for us or to us that the Word does not already accomplish as we abide in it? Now, think about that. The Word of God is the agent through which deity dwells in us, and we dwell in deity. We know how to walk in the light only through the, words, the revealed words of God. How do I know the right path? How do I know how to walk the straight and narrow? The Spirit reveals it. How? Through His Word, not by talking to me. Because if an angel from heaven preached any other gospel than what we have received, let him be a curse. That tells us that the God, Lord's told us what He wants to know in His Word. It was the Spirit that would lead them into all truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right? Now, how does God reveal His Word? Well, God has always revealed His Word to men. There's a need for divine guidance. The Scriptures reveal to us the fallible nature of human judgment. As we already read, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. 
Now, recognizing the limits of our personal assessments of truth and righteousness, we acknowledge our dependence upon God to lead us. I don't know how to lead myself, but the Word of God leads me. God reveals His Word to us. Do you remember in John chapter 14 and verse 7 that Jesus told John that if he knew Jesus, he knew the Father? And Philip asked Jesus to show him the Father in chapter 14 and verse 8. And Jesus said to him in John 14, 9, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Think about that, friends. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. You see the oneness there? Now, God revealed Himself in His person. They said, Where is your Father? And Jesus answered and said to him, John 8, 19, You neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father too. In John 12, verse 45, He who sees me sees Him, and the one, I am the one that has been sent by Him. Jesus is the image of the invisible God the expressed image of His person. Now, Jesus spoke God's words. Do you not know, believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, Jesus said. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Jesus was the agent by which the Word of God, or God's words, were being activated. Jesus was the agent through which the prophecies were being fulfilled. You see? Pilate was an agent through which Pilate, a prophecy was being fulfilled. Judas was an agent by which prophecy was being fulfilled. And none of them really understood or knew all of the details of that except Jesus. Jesus frequently emphasized that His words were the words of the Father. His words and the Father's words were the same. But the authority that He got while on this earth in the flesh came from the Father. On the night when Jesus, before He died, He said this in John 17 and verse 8, if you have your Bibles, John 17, 8, I have given to him the, them the words that ye have given Me. So Jesus was giving the apostles the words that God gave Him. And they have received them, He says. They have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So they received the words, He gave the words to them, they received it, and they believed the words. Okay? Jesus speaks through His words. God speaks through His words. Go all the way back to Genesis 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, and God said, and God said, over and over and over, words by which, words of life, beautiful words. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, the unity of the Spirit is seen there in the Father sending the Spirit in the form of a dove and lighting on, the, on Jesus, who is in the form of flesh. And God says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased." All right? Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to the apostles. On the night of His betrayal in John 13 through 17, He met with His apostles, and here are the things Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do. John 14, 16 through 17, He would be with them like a comforter. You can imagine how the apostles felt when they realized Jesus is going to die on the cross. And Jesus recognized that. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I will send the Comforter, and He will guide you into all truth and bring to your remembrance the things that I have said and done. So the Spirit literally dwelled in them and directed the words that they spoke without taking over their free will. Isn't that amazing? The Comforter would teach them all things, John 14, 26. The Gospels were written without totally relying on one of one's ability to remember the works and words of, of the Lord. And 
The Spirit directed them. And John reveals, he says, there are many other things that were done in his presence. But he says, the world could not contain a book like that. But these are written that ye might believe. Believe what? Believe the words that were written. Okay. Now, why is that important, that I believe the words that are written, you see? Most, most people up this way, I mean, everyone certainly watching this program, all of you, believe this is the Word of God, don't you? You believe it's the inspired Word of God. So, why, do we, why is it important that we believe that? Why would we even say such a thing? Kind of like as the young people say today, that's a dumb moment. Of course it's the Word of God. Sure it is. It either is God's Word or it's the biggest farce that's ever been written. But it is powerful. And you can't study it enough because every time you study it, some nuance of it comes out, just like looking at a diamond in, a, in one of the little monocles they give you. And you can never discover all the facets of a diamond, ever. And so it is with God's Word. We can never discover or mine the depths of it fully. That's why it's so fascinating and why you need to catch fire and learn what it says and be on fire to learn more. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, He met with His apostles. And here's the things the Spirit would do. The Comforter is called the Spirit of Truth. And He would testify of Jesus. He would guide them into all truth. And these promises are quoted as if they were promised to every believer, friends. But remember, in John 13 through 17, He is meeting with His apostles. And He's promising them these things. Now, if it's true that each individual Christian, that these promises were made to them, then every believer could give new pages to add to the New Testament. Because there are so many doctrines out there. We just add them in. But I don't know that anybody would presume to add the words of their preacher that he just says off the top of his head into the Bible. And if a preacher tells you something that is not found in the Bible, you know it's a lie. So once again we ask the question, what would the Holy Spirit do for you, to you, that the Word of God does not accomplish in you through your obedience to it? You see? Well, let's look at this baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, because this is, this is a very controversial subject too, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's look at that. The earliest promises of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it was a promise, not a commandment, might appear to be given to all men. Matthew 3 and verse 11, Mark 1, 4, Luke 3, 16, and John 1, 33. But Jesus commentates on this. Jesus' promise in Acts 1, 5 is limited to the 12. Again, Look at the antecedents to the pronouns in Acts 1, 2 through 5, and you see who he's talking to. And that's just simple English. He's talking to the apostles. Not many days hence points to the events of Acts 2. And he told them to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. The only other case described of the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit is on the household of Cornelius, in Acts chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. And the Jews there said the gospel should be preached to the Gentiles. Well, it's in Acts chapter 10 that that actually takes place. All right, the first Gentile convert, and that was for the purpose of the Lord recognizing what needed to be said. The apostles worked miracles that confirmed the word that they preached was God's word. These were the signs of an apostle, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. We're going to pause here. We just got a few minutes here at the end of our program. We've got a call coming in. Let's uh, take this call. Yes, caller? Yeah. Fast? Yeah, Leonard. How are you doing? Yeah, I, th- I thought you were going to talk on that tongue. I am. Give me a chance. <laughs> yeah, I am. Give me a chance. We're getting ready to get into that right now. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 on the gift of tongues, just briefly uh, as we go through this, and we're going to talk more about it the next show because we didn't have time to do it, I had to lay some groundwork. But on the gift of tongues, um, the tongues that are talked about in 1 Corinthians 13 are languages, Acts chapter 2. There's 19 different nations in Acts chapter 2 that are the languages that the people heard in the first manifestation of the gift of tongues. And they are languages that are understood. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 and 14, that is uh, Paul correcting the problem at Corinth that existed over the proper, uh, the improper use of spiritual gifts. Uh, uh, tongues is just one of nine spiritual gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 and 13 and 14. But notice there that chapter 13 says that these things will go away. Something would go away. The people at Corinth were practicing the gifts that they had and the tongues were one of them that they were given because they didn't have a New Testament to go around with. They needed to have uh, the spiritual gifts given to them and it was done by the laying on of the apostles' hands. And so when the apostles died, Acts 8, uh, they had to send for Peter and John to come down and lay hands on the Samaritans because they had been converted but they hadn't had any spiritual gifts given to them yet. That was only done through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And at first... I thought you were going to talk about the tongue on the, on the TV. Yeah. Well, I am. I am. And, uh, it's, too, it's too late now, ain't it? No, no. No, no. I don't know. I'm doing it right now. Are you doing it now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, I, I, I'll make sure I'm, 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 not, I'm not catching you. Okay, I'm doing it right now. I'm, I'm reading 1 Corinthians 13 where it says here that where there be tongues they shall cease. Uh, where there be prophecies they shall cease. Uh, charity never fails. All right? For All now... Right. Hold on just a minute. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is his wife here. Uh, yeah, I know. How you doing? Good. Oh, I'm good. What's your questions? Um, he wanted the, the is the tongues the is the tongue relevant now as they had been back or has it ever been before anyway? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there have definitely there was a time when there were tongues that were given. The first demonstration of that was in Acts 2, when uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles spoke in tongues, and everybody understood, notice, in their own language. But the yeah. tongues that are spoken today by people that claim to speak in tongues are nowhere like what was spoken of in the New Testament. Because what they do is they just start talking about things, and there's no interpreter of what they've said. They just tell you, God told me to say this, and they just uh, go on with it. Well, that's not what to how tongues were used here. They had to be understandable. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, Paul tells them, if no one, if there is no interpreter in the assembly, that you are to be quiet. So the, per so the person, it, there was no reason for someone to speak in tongues if you didn't have somebody that could interpret and say what they had said. Mm -hmm. And the person that was speaking in the tongue was never the interpreter. Had to have an outside source that interpreted what was said. Now all the all the spiritual all the spiritual gifts that were given are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through verse 11. And uh, but tongues is only one thing, one gift that was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. We know that people today don't speak in the tongues of the Bible because the apostles all died and that was the only way somebody could get the power to do that. So those people that say they have the gift of tongues like the Bible people did, they're, they're mistaken. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I know. It's not relevant now. 
Right. Uh-huh. Right, because we, then, because we have the Bible today, 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. And I'm, I'm, right. going, to, I'm going to continue this next, next program, and uh, we'll, we're going to talk a whole lot more about this in detail. Just, I've, I've just covered just a little bit of this tonight because my time got away from me. But, uh, mm-hmm. and that's my fault, and I apologize for that. That's okay. But, uh, I, I understand. But we're going but we to. But we will still listen to you, and, and uh, we understand what you're saying. Okay, all right. But we're going to be getting, getting more in detail. Okay. Yeah, no, my fault. Okay, all right. Take care. Bye bye. Um, it goes down. Uh, what they did. All right. Well, we thank you so much for tuning in. That was one of the men that, uh, has had a stroke and he just called in and uh, he, he was uh, wondering about uh, are we going to get to tongues. We did not get to the gift of uh, the Spirit and we are going to deal with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter 12, and chapter 14 in our next program in detail on the miraculous gifts at Corinth. And we're going to deal with the question of the unity that we can have but we can't have unity when everybody says that God told them this and God told them that. How do you know? Well, because God told me. And there's nobody can verify that. So just somebody says something and you just go along with it? No. That's not how gifts were given back then. The tongues were given to bring order and unity, not disorder. And that's why the Corinthians are corrected, because they're misusing those gifts like many do today. Uh, And the gifts that people say they have today they don't have them because the means by which they, they had them, the laying on of the apostles' hands, was, is not around anymore. The reason is we have the Word of God. The Spirit dwells in us. We don't need the Holy Spirit to tell us anything anymore because the Spirit has spoken once for all, Jude 3, once for all delivered to the saints. And so we have the Word of God once and for all delivered. No adding to, no taking from. So that tells us that anyone, though we or an angel from heaven, speaks to us anything else, let him be condemned. So that's very clear. We're going to expand more on that next week. And boy, we thank you for the calls. We've been covered up with calls tonight. And uh, that's very, very uh, welcome. And we thank you for that. And we hope that you will tune in again next week, as we can, or ne- in two weeks, as we continue this program on the Holy Spirit. We expected there would be a lot of interest, and there is. It's a very important subject because we don't want to say the wrong thing about the Spirit or make people think we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. We just want to teach what the Bible says as the Bible says. Remember, we need to get out of the way and let God's Word speak. That's what we're trying to do. And we apologize for any discrepancies tonight or any promises that we may have made that somebody says, well, you didn't do that. So apologize sincerely for that. And we'll get to that next time. And if anyone wants to study any in between, we are available. And you just let me know. I'll come out to your house and study these issues with you or any other issues, Bible issue. Thank you so much for your time tonight. We're running short, so we're going to bid you good evening. Thank you for tuning in. Good night.